Hello, and welcome to the CCF Online channel. We are excited for you to be part of another worship experience. We pray that what you learn here today will deepen your relationship with Jesus. Enjoy the message. What a joy, what a privilege to be back. Thank you for your prayers. We had a great time in CCF Australia, CCF New Zealand. Before we continue, I want us to be reminded of the Counterflow Parenting Conference. Now, the Counterflow Parenting Conference, if you look at the overhead projector, even if you are single, you can come because you are also spiritual parents. If you have friends and they are struggling with teenagers, with children, come. Many, many workshops. If you cannot afford it, pay as much as you can. The balance collected from Pastor Ricky Sartu and um, the rest, but don't let money be a problem. Let me ask you a question. What is the best thing that has ever happened to you? Can you whisper to your neighbor the best thing that has ever happened to you? Whisper to your neighbor. For some of you, what will you say? When I passed the bar exam, or when I met my wife, when I met my spouse, did you say those things? Or did you say, when I met Jesus? How many of you say, said, I met Jesus, the best thing that happened to me? Raise your hand. Now, those of you who did not raise your hand, that the best thing that ever happened to you is when you met Jesus, I like to convince you, to encourage you, and to share with you to listen to this message. The best thing that happened to me years ago was when Jesus found me. And because it was the best thing that happened to me, the best thing I can do for others, that you can do for others, is to share Jesus. If you don't have a desire to share Jesus, Perhaps you need to listen today. How come? I'm going to give you a chart, and you tell me in this spectrum where you are today. All right? The chart is something like this. Your attitude about sharing Christ. For some people, they're hostile. They really don't want anything about Jesus. For some of you, maybe you are indifferent. You don't care. You have never shared Christ with anybody. You are indifferent. For others, you care, but you are afraid. You are fearful. You are afraid of rejection. For others, you are eager. You really want to share Christ. Can you whisper to your neighbor, which one are you in this spectrum? Whisper. Be honest. Have you whispered something? All right. I want to share with you why I want you to be eager. Somebody was telling me about the Mercedes-Benz ad. How the Mercedes-Benz was driving very fast and it hit a solid wall. And when it hit the solid wall, you will see the metal, the body absorbing the crust. Amazing technology in order to protect the lives of the passengers. Somebody asked the representative of Mercedes-Benz, have you patented this technology? And this guy said the most amazing thing. Without thinking, he said, there are certain things in life that is so important you share. There are things in life that is so important you share. Now, if the world can think of sharing something important, what about us? Certain things are so good you need to share. 
I will share with you now the attitude of the Apostle Paul. Everybody, read together. Romans 1, 14, 15, 16. Together, everybody. The Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. A few words I want to emphasize. The first one is he's saying, I am under obligation to preach the gospel. The second important word I want you to remember is this. I am eager to preach the gospel. And the third word I want you to see is Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. Now, before I explain this further, let me go to the first word. The first word, I am under obligation. The Greek word for this is in debt. In Tagalog, my utang po ako. I am in debt. There are two ways how that word is used, how you develop indebtedness. Number one, when you borrow money, you need to pay back. Number two, when somebody entrusts to you something precious that you are to pass it on to others. The Apostle Paul is trying to explain to us it was the latter. He is saying, God entrusted to me something so precious that I'm supposed to pass it on to you. So that is how that word is used. He is saying, I am under obligation. Some Bible translation uses the word, I am in debt. It is something you need to do. Sharing Christ is a responsibility. You must understand that. But more than a responsibility, it is a privilege. Look at what he said. Everybody, for my part, I am eager. To do what? Everybody read. <clears throat> Preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. It was the dream of everybody to be able to visit Rome in the time of Paul because Rome was the capital, the educated, the rich, the influential politicians, they were in Rome. He did not want to go there to be a tourist. He wanted to go there to preach the gospel. <clears throat> What is the gospel? Everybody, let's read. I am not ashamed. Why are we ashamed of the gospel? Can you whisper to your neighbor why sometimes you don't like to share the gospel? Whisper. <coughs> Be honest. Why are we reluctant? Can I share with you some reasons? Fear of rejection. Fear of not knowing what to do. What else? Why are we afraid? Let me give you an example. If your neighbor's house is burning at midnight and you just went home and you see the first floor is burning <clears throat> and you know that your neighbor is sleeping on the second floor, what will you do? Will you barge in? Will you shout and wake him up? Yes or no? Or will you say, you know what? It's embarrassing. I don't want to wake him up. You know, he, he, must, he must be sleeping. What will you do? You're waking him up. The same thing with the gospel. Until you understand the gospel, until you understand the problem, friends, why should you be eager to share the gospel? Give you another example. If I tell you I've discovered a cure for cancer, 
Will you be excited? Yes or no? Depends. Because if you have no cancer, number two, you don't even know the meaning of cancer. It's totally irrelevant to you. However, if you have cancer, or your wife have cancer, or your parents have cancer, and, they, and after the visiting the hospital, the doctor said, sorry, it's too late. You have three months to live. And you go see another doctor, and the other doctor will tell you exactly the same thing. I'm sorry, we cannot operate on you. It's too late, you have three months to live. How would you feel? Horrible, yes or no? I want you to imagine now, you have three months to live. And then suddenly, somebody comes along. And when that person comes along, he tells you, you know what? I found a cure. And you said, really? And then you went through his program. And you are completely healed. Tell me, will you be excited to talk about the cure? Yes or no? If you are not, I suggest you go see a psychiatrist. But if you are a normal human being like me, I cannot stop telling everybody, this guy has the cure. Yes or no? What's the difference? Personal experience. Until you have a personal encounter with the Lord, with the gospel, you will not be excited. And some of you have never shared Christ with anybody. Is it possible? I am not judging you, so be careful now. But I'm just saying, is it possible? You have religion, but you never had a personal encounter with the saving power of Jesus. Is that possible? I think so. Because in my experiences, in my dealing with thousands and thousands of people, especially CCFers, I know one thing is sure. When you fall in love with Jesus, when you encounter Jesus, you will talk about Jesus. So, Paul tells us why he's not ashamed. Because, everybody read, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks. What Paul is saying is this. It is a pronoun, am I correct? It is referring to what? Notice, it is the power of God. What is the power of God? It is referring to the gospel. The gospel in Greek, in English, simply means good news. So gospel, evangelio, means good news. What is the good news? Jesus changed my life. Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He rose again from the dead, and I am saved. I am forgiven because of Jesus. That is the gospel. Do you know where that verse is found to define to us the gospel? Let me share with you. Everybody read this together. I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you receive, in which also you stand. He's now going to tell you the gospel which he preached. The gospel is found in the Bible, in particular, 1 Corinthians 15. What is the gospel? Let's find out. He tells us, by which also you are saved. So one thing you learn about the gospel is you are saved. Past tense. You can be sure you are saved. What's the condition? If you hold fast the word. That's the idea of faith. You believe in it. You see, look at me. To believe and not to act upon it is not yet to believe. To believe in Jesus and not to obey Jesus it's not yet to believe. Which I preach to you unless you believe in vain. Now, what is the gospel? Are you ready to find out? 
This is what he tells us. What is the gospel? What is the good news? I delivered to you as of first importance. In other words, I'm telling you now, this is the most primero uno. This is the most important. What I also received. Everybody, what is the gospel? Everybody read. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. The first thing you learn about the gospel, why it can save you, is that Christ died for our sins. Until you understand that Jesus did not die there by accident, but it was prophesied, he came to fulfill his mission for your sins, for my sins, he took your place. Until that is very clear, you will never understand the cross. You will never understand why Jesus had to die. Some people tell me, well, because he loved us. There are many ways to show love. You don't have to die on the cross. There is no other way for the redemption of sin, for sins to be forgiven, apart from Jesus dying on the cross in your place, in my place. So he died for our sins. Everybody say that with me. Christ died for our sins. So change the pronoun now. Christ died for my sins. Christ died for my sins. That's not enough. What's the gospel? And, everybody read. <clears throat> he was buried. And, he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So, in summary, what is the gospel? Jesus died on the cross for my sins. He was buried to prove that he died because other religion today does not believe Jesus really died. The Bible says he died, but he rose again to prove to us he is the Savior, he is the Son of God. So that is the gospel. So what's the message today, everybody? Share Christ. Turn to your neighbor. Tell your neighbor. Share Christ. <clears throat> when I see you next week, and I ask you, what was the message? What will you tell me? <clears throat> Don't tell me it was a good message. Pastor, it was good. Okay. What is the message? Turn to your neighbor. Look at them in the eyes. Tell them. <coughs> Share Christ. Everybody, how do you share Christ? What do you mean by sharing Christ? Everybody, simple definition. Everybody read. It is taking the initiative to help people understand the good news about Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit, leaving the outcome to God. Notice, first, take the initiative. And what do you talk about? <coughs> the good news about Jesus. Not in your power, in the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the outcome to God. You don't force people to believe. And many of you are ashamed, are afraid, because you feel you will be a failure if people don't believe. No, no, no. Success is not defined that way. Success is defined as faithfulness. Just share the Bible honestly, truthfully. <coughs> Let me share with you what we talk about. Why do we need to share the gospel? It is a responsibility. Paul said, I am under obligation. It is also a privilege. I am eager. Why privilege? Because the gospel changed lives. I'm not ashamed. It is the power of God. So let's review. Next week, we will continue our series. Before we go back to Exodus, there will be one more series on sharing the gospel. How do you do it? But in the meantime, I want to share with you 
the meaning of responsibility. Everybody read together. Ezekiel 33, 7. Please read. <coughs> no, no, no. You guys, I heard, are very educated. You must read aloud at the same time. Ready, go. Now. <coughs> So God is saying to Ezekiel, I'm making you a watchman. The word watchman has the following job description. He stays in the tower, he looks around, and if an enemy is coming, he will sound the trumpet. He will sound the alarm so that people will take heed. That's the job of a watchman. Now, putting that in the Christian context, the Lord is now telling Ezekiel, what do I mean by making you a watchman? Everybody read. When I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you will surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood I will require from your hand. That is the meaning of responsibility. You are given a trust, an assignment to pass this on. Read the next verse. But if you on your part warn a wicked man to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way. He will die in his iniquity. But you have delivered your life. But God is saying, your job is to be faithful. Warn people. Tell them the good news. You see, this is a language of love, not condemnation. God is saying, I love the world. For God so loved the world. And God is saying, you are my messenger. You tell them. You tell them. And if you tell them and they don't listen to you, God is saying, that's okay. But you got to tell them. You are responsible. So tell your neighbor, share Christ. You are responsible. So the Apostle Paul explained his own life. Look at how the Apostle Paul understood the principle. Everybody read. Acts 20, 26, 27. Everybody? Therefore, I testify to you this day, I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Ladies and gentlemen, that was my nightmare years ago. That I will go to heaven alone and my classmates and my friends and my business associates will see me and they will tell me on judgment day, Peter, why did you not even bother to tell us, I made a commitment from that day forward. I am going to do my best to tell people the good news about Jesus. In the last few weeks, our pastors have been sharing with you how to do this. Remember, pray, you pray, and then what, after that, you sh sh what? pray, care. You show people you care. And after caring, what do you do? You share exactly what we are doing today. We are on the third part. You share. Look at me. If you just pray and care and do good deeds, look at me. I can do good deeds for my neighbor for 10 years. I can bring food to him. I can bring his children to school. I can help him borrow my lawnmower. I can do a lot of good things. But if I don't share with him the gospel, you know what will enter my neighbor's mind after 10 years? A Christian is a good person. They do good things. That's all. It's not enough to care, to do good things. You got to share. If you don't share, how will they know what motivated you to do good things? Don't make them into a project. You got to love people. 
but you got to learn. So, everybody, read this together. So, Paul said, I am under obligation. It's a duty. But for him, it's more than a duty. He said, for my part, I am eager. You know why he's eager? Let me tell you. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm eager. Why? Everybody read. It is the power of God for salvation. The presumption is this. We are lost. And there are many kinds of lostness. Some people are lost emotionally, relationship-wise. There are many lostness which you will learn today. But the truth is this. We all need salvation. But some people don't understand they need salvation. You know why? They don't realize they're lost. So he's saying, I want to share. Because it is God's power to save people. And then he tells us, the gospel is a message of love. You know why? It is to, everybody read, to everyone who believes. Nothing to do with whether you're rich or poor. It is to everyone on one condition. You cling to it. You believe. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. The power of God to change lives. This morning, we are privileged, this afternoon, I'm privileged to introduce to you a special guest from the States. <clears throat> His name is Christian Hosoy. He is the world champion skater in the Guinness Book of Record, and he's the equivalent of Michael Jordan in skating, Manny Pacquiao in boxing. Let us welcome my friend, Christian Jose. Hosoy. <laughs> now, before he speaks, I want you to show a video of what he did yesterday afternoon. How many of you, how many of you were here yesterday afternoon? The young ones. The young ones. Did you see him? Did you see me? Now, show. I want to show you how good our brother, you know, in his skating. And he will share with you how the Lord transformed his life. But let's watch this video first. Amen and amen. We had an amazing time yesterday. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for CCF inviting us out. Uh, I'm here just to share my testimony with you. And um, how many of you had big dreams when you were young? Raise your hand. How many of you are, that are old still got big dreams? Amen. Well, I was that kid that had big dreams. You know, I just wanted to dominate the world. I wanted to be the best, and Bruce Lee was my idol. And so, of course, right, I wanted to be the best. He was the best. And so my intention was to be the best skateboarder in the world. And soon I became a world champion at the young age of about 16 years old. See, I started young, eight years old, wanting to be the best, became the best amateur at 12, became the best in the world at 16. But how many of you know that you start off with pure intentions? You start off wanting to be the best in the world at something. You just want to be great. But then all of a sudden, peer pressure to fit in comes upon you. You've got to do things that are not right according to God's word. And you start compromising who you are to fit in. And it's, it's just a matter of time before you think that that's what you got to do to fit in. And that was me. I thought, you know what? If I'm going to be a pro skateboarder, I got to party. I got to make money. I got to go out with girls. I got to do drugs. And that's the peer pressure that the world puts on us, especially world champions like myself. 
or even your world champion, Manny Pacquiao. We all face those, those temptations. And when you're young and you don't have a group of supporters, mentors in your life, building a platform of godly principles in your life, it's just a matter of time before that lifestyle takes you out. And that was me. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 11, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. And he was talking to me when I read that, Christian. Thoughts of peace, not evil. Plans to give you a future and a hope. You see, I've never heard those words before. And, and this is what God wanted to give me. That's why it's so important for us to share our faith with other people. And I believe that that's what God wants to give you. Peace, not evil. And with that lifestyle of being growing up in Hollywood, some of you know my story, some of you don't. But growing up in California and the culture of skateboarding, you just feel like you have to fit in. And that's the peer pressure that takes so many people out. And I was one of them. And I always tell people, you know what? I had it all. I had it all on a silver platter. World champions, covers of magazines, millions of dollars, traveling the world, just trophies, everybody telling me how great I am. And, and I thought that would satisfy me. I'm sure some of you here think that because you become famous or you become rich, it's going to satisfy you. I'm here to tell you that will never satisfy you. That will never, that will never be something that lasts. And for me, I always tell everybody I was like a bucket full of holes. And I was searching for love in all those places. I searched for it in money. I searched for it in being a world champion. I searched for it in girls. I searched for it in drugs. And I never was satisfied. I was always empty at the end of the day because that bucket that was full of holes, it just kept draining out and draining out and draining out. You may feel like that today. You may be going, why am I not satisfied? I've got money, I've got family, I've got friends. See, Matthew chapter 16, verse 26 says that, that for what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world but yet forfeits his own soul? You see, I was forfeiting my soul. I was empty and dying on the inside. And I didn't even know it because I was searching for true love and I couldn't find it. You see, I was lost. And if, if the trophies and being the best in the world don't satisfy you, being rich, having hundreds of friends all around you all the time, man, if I can't find it here, I'm going to find it in the dark things of the world. I started getting more into drugs, going out to parties, trying to figure out what, what's going to satisfy me. And so now I'm diving into heavy-duty drug addiction. I'm experimenting with drugs. And then I got introduced to this drug called Speed, crystal methamphetamine. Here, it's Shabu. It's a drug that takes so many kids out. My heart breaks when I see people that are on it or they're huffing the glue. It's destroying their future, and it was destroying mine. See, but I had no idea there was a God that loved me, that wanted to give me true love. He loved me with a love that lasts. And so I'm looking for it in all the wrong places. And it just kept draining out. Then I made a terrible decision to carry a bunch of drugs on an airplane. And I get arrested. And I'm looking at 10 years prison time. You would think that my life is over. You would think, oh my gosh, Christian's life's over. It's, I mean, but I always say, but God. Say that with me. Say, but God. See, but God intervened at that very moment when I was at my lowest place. And God will intervene in your life when you're at your lowest place. And a lot of you have experienced that. And 
Now I look back at getting arrested and it's the best thing that ever happened to me. You see, right when I got arrested, my wife said, Christian, I'm quitting drugs and I'm going to church. She was my girlfriend and I went, I'll go. I thought, God's good, I'm good. Drugs are good, skateboarding's good. If there's a heaven, I'm going there because I'm good. That was my idea of God. You see, I'd never read a Bible before, never grew up in church, but I thought I was a good person and that my works were going to allow me into a place called heaven one day. And I call her and I said, look, I'm looking at 10 years. And she said, you know what? We just got to trust in God. And I was like, God, I need a lawyer. I need an attorney. I need bail. She's like, no, God's going to help us. She said, go get a Bible. That day, I got arrested. I went, grabbed a Bible, opened it up for the first time in my whole life. And it was like God spoke his truth to me. The scales fell off my eyes. I really realized that God had a purpose and a plan for my life, that I wasn't just created to exist, but there was a plan. And that's the power of the gospel. Somebody shared it with me. And in my darkest place, I received God's forgiveness and his love, his mercy, his grace. And it was God's love and his goodness that led me to a place of repentance. It wasn't a, a God that wanted to punish me. It was a God that wanted to love me. There's a God that wants to love you, not just sit here and tell you how bad you're acting or how you're doing things that's not right. No, God loves you so much that he wants to have a relationship with you. And when you build that relationship with you, you start to love him back and you love him through your actions. John chapter 14 verse 15 says, if you love me, who loves God in here? Raise your hand. He says, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. That's our proof. That's the byproduct of our faith when we realize that God died on a cross for our sins. John chapter 3 verse 16 says, for God so loved the world. Who's the world? That's me and you. That he gave his only begotten son, that whoever shall trust in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. See, that's the power of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that all those who are in Christ are a new creation. Old things passed away, behold, all things have become new. You see, my life was brand new. And get this, I got to prison, and everyone said it's such a shame, Christian went from freedom his whole life to getting locked up in a prison cell for 10 years. And I tell everybody it's the opposite. I was living in sin and death in prison my whole life and got into a prison cell, opened up the Bible, the gospel spoke to me, and I got set free by the power of God's love in a prison cell. And for the first time in my life, I was a free man. Whoo! That's the power of the gospel. And I spent five years in prison, a free man, for the first time in my whole entire life. You see, I didn't choose God. He chose me. He, he says, I chose you, Christian. You did not choose me. And I've appointed you to go. When I read that, I was like, go where? Mark 16, 15 says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Look where I'm at. I'm in the Philippines. Come on. I took that calling, and it is the great commission. This church is the great commission church, right? Come on, somebody. C, C, F. Christian Commission Fellowship. Now I'm eager to share my faith and to share the gospel, to preach it, using skateboarding as a vehicle and a platform to preach the gospel. God is using my gifts and talents to share my faith around the world. I, I pray today that you make that same decision. You see, my journey started when I gave my life to Jesus. Don't hesitate. 
Don't delay. Tomorrow's not promised. Give your lives to Jesus today. I love you. God bless you. Praise God. Is God amazing? The power of God to change lives. How many years have you been set free from drug addiction, brother? I have been set free for 16 years, have not touched a drug, completely delivered, set free. My friend, why share Christ? The power of the gospel, the power of Christ to transform lives. Let's all stand up and pray for him. Father God in heaven, I thank you. Raise your right hand. Father God in heaven, I thank you for my brother. Thank you for Christian, for what you have done in his life. How something bad, being in prison, can become something good. Because he was set free in prison. And Lord, I pray for many others of us here who may be in prison today. They, they seem to be free, but they are in prison. I pray that today's message will set them free. I pray for my brother, Christian. Use him, protect his family, protect his testimony. Keep him always in the center of your will. And that he will always bring glory and honor to your name. Thank you for representing you to the Philippines today. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Now, you will say, how do I do that? Now, part two will be here next week. But in the meantime, let me share with you, how do you do that? How do you share the gospel? Everybody, look at what the Bible tells us. Number one, you need to pray. Everybody say, praying at the same time for us that God will open up to us a door for the Word. So you need to learn to pray. That's why three weeks ago, we started with pray, care, share. Pray, so that we may speak for the mystery of Christ for which I have been in prison, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. So you need to start with prayer. You pray for opportunities. You pray that God will help you speak the word clearly. We have a training session this Thursday. To those of you who would like to learn how to share, you come Thursday. I have instructed all the thousands of D groups in CCF, especially in the main, to teach your people the meaning of every member a discipler. We have this program where every member will share the gospel. Some of you have gone through the training, but all of us, we are going to practice sharing the gospel. How? You pray. You have been doing that. Amen. And then you care for people, you show good deeds, and you share. Now, notice, how do you do it, everybody? Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. In other words, your conduct. You want to talk about Jesus? Don't bring shame to Jesus by your lifestyle. So this is important. Why I believe in discipleship. Because discipleship, CCF, means what? Christ committed followers. You need to show people by your life. You are not perfect, but you are authentic. Conduct yourselves properly, especially if you want to witness for Jesus. And then the Bible tells us, let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. In other words, you pray for wisdom, what to say, how to respond to each person. So how do you do this? You pray. Yes? Your conduct, you care for people, and then you share. Outside the worship service, we have materials for you. You can get them, and you can share that with any of your friends. My wife told me what happened a few weeks ago. Every Thursday, they say, wow, women. The women will come. And one of those who came, came to know Jesus, got a copy of how to share the gospel, shared with their family. Their whole family came to know Jesus, shared with their friends, came to know Jesus. They all started coming. Why? It's so simple. Share Jesus. You don't need a PhD to share Jesus. Amen? So, I encourage you to do that. Now, I have another sharer. 
a young and upcoming lawyer, and by faith, I'm anointing her to be a lawyer already. She finished her graduate. She graduated. Let's welcome Margot. How she applied, how to share. Okay. How do you share the gospel? Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. So my name is Margot Remoyo, and I committed my life to the Lord in 2005 at an Elevate retreat. As the desire to know him more grew, so did the desire to share him with others because he had changed my life. When I was about to enter Ateneo Law School as a freshman in 2011, I wasn't very excited. I couldn't imagine myself as a future lawyer. I was certain, however, that one of the reasons why God had placed me there was to share the love of Christ with others. So I prayed and committed to live my life in a manner worthy of this calling only by God's grace. I studied hard and built relationships with my blockmates. Even in the first semester, I would have deep conversations with them about God and life. These would usually happen when they asked to ride with me from our campus in Makati to the Quezon City area where I lived. Looking back, I realized that God used the traffic, and it was a lot of traffic to provide me with opportunities to talk about Him and share the gospel with my blockmates and friends. It was during fasting week of 2013 in January when I decided to use the CCF prayer bookmark. I wrote on one side the names of my blockmates and my two cousins, all of whom I was already praying for. It's amazing how one by one, God crossed off the names on that list. The first was my blockmate, whom I had been friends with since freshman year when we spent Valentine's Day together. We decided it would be our annual tradition. When Valentine's Day of our junior year was coming up, I prayed for God to open our heart to hear the gospel. In our conversation, I asked her if I could tell her how I've experienced God's love. Perfect for Heart's Day. She gladly listened. And at the end of our conversation, she prayed with me to receive Christ in her heart as her personal Lord and Savior. Until we graduated, we would get to talk and pray together, and she went with me to Bible study. This Bible study was started by some upperclassmen when I was a freshman. At the end of my first semester in junior year, the restaurant where we held it had to relocate, so we lost our venue. This led our core group of three people to prayerfully decide that we would stop holding weekly Bible studies and instead open 3D groups. I was, I was reluctant at first because in, in the last three years that we held Bible studies, my blockmates barely came. So would they even respond to my text messages this time? But God reminded me to be obedient and to pray. He would take care of the things outside of my control. Surprisingly enough, most of the women in my bookmark attended the first two weeks, and they heard the gospel. I prayed with those who desired to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Our small group continued to meet weekly, and we were joined by our other blockmates and even freshmen. This was a beautiful reminder to me that God was at work through those years, and that praying in His name accomplishes much. In law school, there's very little time to hang out with people outside your circle of friends, but when God has a will, he makes a way. One night, my class ended at 9 p.m., and I was very tired. When I headed out of the building, it started to drizzle, and I saw one of the women in my bookmark and offered to share my umbrella. She said she was commuting, so I offered to drop her off closer to her house. I was half hoping she would decline, but she didn't. In my mind, I prayed, Lord, I'm very tired. If you want me to minister to her, will you please provide the strength and the opening also? Suddenly, the rain started pouring very hard, and my friend and I swapped stories about how we had become flood victims before. And then she commented that these rainstorms and earthquakes are getting more and more frequent every year. And I thought, God had given me my opening. I told her a little bit about what the Bible says about calamities and earthquakes. And in Tagalog, she said, oh, if something happens, I wonder where I'm going. So I thank God for the opportunity, shared a little bit of my testimony with her, and proceeded to share the gospel. When I asked her if she had ever prayed to put her faith in Jesus, she told me she needed time to think about everything that I had shared. Now, this one guy in my list became a good friend of mine because I would help him out with his campaigns when he ran for student government. We also interned in the same firm one summer. On the way home from work one night, God sensed, uh, God, I sensed that God was leading me to share the gospel with him. 
eventually, he started attending the small group led by one of my friends. I had been praying for my cousins on the list for four years already. Once in a while, they expressed a curiosity about this D group that I was attending weekly. Finally, just the past summer, they asked for a sample Bible study when we went to the beach with my D group downline. This was an opportunity to share the gospel with them, and I believe they prayed to put their faith in Jesus. All I really did was pray for these people and build relationships with them as I nurtured my own relationship with the Lord. But he led me to those opportunities to talk about him and share the gospel with them. In the past four years of sharing God's love with others, he ministered to me the most. I entered law school without many expectations, but I've come out of it with a story of God's faithfulness in my life. As a bonus and only by his grace, I also graduated with honors, and I will be taking the bar exam with my batch next month. So if, so if you remember, please pray for us. May God alone be glorified. Thank you, and God bless you all. Praise God. Praise God. Now, let's all stand up again. Pray for her. You know why? I pray that God will use Margot mightily in the years to come. Do you mind raising your right hand again? Father God in heaven, I pray for Margot and her family, that you will make this family unique and special for your glory. I pray for her protection. I pray for her bar exam, that she will pass very well with flying colors and give you the greatest glory and honor in all that she'll be doing. And I pray for her future. I pray for what you will uh, what she will do for your kingdom, for your glory, and above all, protect our sister. Let her to keep walking in the center of your will, in holiness and purity, for your glory, for your honor. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, sister. <clears throat> do you know that for the Apostle Paul, it is not just an obligation, a duty, a responsibility. It is a privilege. Why? The power of God, the privilege is amazing. For example, by the way, I want to remind you, uh, if you want to go through training, Thursday, 7 p.m., multipurpose hall. If you want to learn how to share the gospel. I had the privilege of visiting CCF New Zealand. And our pastor there is Ryan and Lay. How many of you remember Pastor Ryan and Lay? Raise your hand. Now, <clears throat> what was amazing was that Pastor Ryan told me, Peter, do you remember that you invited my father for lunch and shared the gospel with my father? Apparently, I said, of course I remember your father. Her, his father and mother were one of the first two to be in our small group, and they came to know the Lord, and they impacted the life of Ryan. Then the wife spoke. Peter, Peter, do you remember you shared the gospel with my grandfather? I said, your grandfather? Yes, his grandfather. By the way, this is the parents of Ryan. The grandfather of uh, Lay is Ike Punsalan. How many of you remember Ike Punsalan? And I realized a small acts of kindness, sharing the gospel will impact lives beyond your wildest imagination. Can I tell you why? Look at CCF New Zealand today. We were there, and look at the numbers of people that have come to Christ. The mission of CCF is very simple. Honor Christ and make Christ committed followers. Who will make Christ committed followers? All of us are given the task. Now, lastly, let me share with you my conviction why you need to share Christ. Not only is it our responsibility, not only is it a privilege because of the power of Christ to change lives, but it will impact their eternity. You see, the future of people is at stake. Let me share with you what do we mean by that. Jesus gave an amazing story. Everybody read together with me. There was a rich man and he habitually dressed in purple, fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. In other words, it's called tipar every day. You know, party, tipar. During my time, my tipar batayo. It's party every day, good time. And then the Bible says, 
and a poor man named Lazarus who laid at his gate covered with sores. The Bible tells us, longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table, besides even the dogs who were coming and licking his sores. <coughs> As of now, if the Bible ends here, who do you like to be? The rich man or the poor man? How many of you like to be the rich man? Raise your hand. <coughs> How many of you like to be the poor man? How many of you will never raise your hand no matter what I do here? <laughs> Look at me. The choice between rich man and poor man, I want to be the rich man. If the Bible ends here. Do you want to be the rich man or the poor man? Now, be honest. Rich man or poor man? If you want to be the poor man, you go see a psychiatrist later, okay? <laughs> rich man. And then the Bible tells us something happened. The poor man died. <clears throat> and the rich man also died. As of now, is the Bible ends here. You like to be the rich man or the poor man? Would you like to die rich or die poor? How many of you like to die rich? Raise your hand. Now you are talking. Now we are being honest, okay? Finally, you are down to earth. I want to die rich, of course. You have a choice. However, let's find out what happened. The Bible tells us <coughs> when the poor man died, he was carried away by angels to representing heaven. The rich man in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. In other words, when you know what will happen after you die, as of now, would you want to be the rich man or the poor man? <clears throat> Why? By the way, scientifically and statistically, they've made analysis that sooner or later, 100% of everybody here will die. So turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor, Mama Taikarin, <laughs> you will die. Question. After you die, where will you spend eternity? That, my friend, is my personal conviction. Why I do what I do. Why I tell you to do what you are supposed to do. Because it matters. You see, many people think that the rich man went to hell because he was rich. That's not what the Bible is talking about. This is the only parable where you have the name of a poor man. You have the name of the character. His name was Lazarus. Now, he's not the Lazarus of John 11, okay? This is another Lazarus. Jesus made an amazing revelation. Jesus is a master teacher. The word Lazarus, that name is special. It means God is my help. In other words, Lazarus lived a God-centered life. While the rich man did not care about God, he did nothing to help the poor. You know why? He was full of self. All he thought about was himself. You don't even know the name of the rich man. You know why? All he had was money. If all you have in this world is money, when you die, you are nothing. All this rich man had was popularity, parties. When you die, nothing. But this poor man had a name. God is my help. What is the evidence that this rich man do not know the Lord? Very simple. If you don't care about the poor, if you don't care about others, it's all about your life, you don't know Jesus. The Bible tells us if you have Jesus, if you have God, you love others. The one who does not love, the one who does not care for others, does not know God. That's in the Bible. So, friends, let me ask you, do you know the Lord or do you not know the Lord? One of the evidences, do you care for others? The Bible tells us 
He cries out and says, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue. I am in agony in this flame. One thing you can learn is after death, life continues. After death, you can feel, you can speak, you can see, you can remember. Friends, this is from the mouth of Jesus. Can I tell you why this parable is so important? This story is so important. You combine all the apostles, all the prophets. They did not talk about hell more than who? Jesus. Only Jesus he spoke more about heaven, more about hell. Why? Because hell is real. Human imagination cannot even comprehend the concept of hell. But Jesus tells us hell is real. Continue reading. Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you received your good things and likewise Lazarus the bad things. Now he's being comforted here and you are in here. You are in agony. Listen. The poor man went to hell not because he committed sin. Not because he did something. He did nothing to help others. Why? He does not know the Lord. The byproduct of having an intimate relationship with God is love for others. You care for others. I don't know of anybody who has experienced the love of God who will not have a burden for others. You want to help. Amen? So let me look at your life today. Do you know you have the Lord in your heart? Or do you have religion? Now, many people have religion in this country. They go to church. They go to a building every Sunday. Look at their lives. Jesus tells us, by their fruit, you shall know them. We are not saved by good works. But the grace that will save you will have evidence. And then... The, Bible, the story continues. Besides this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fix. Everybody read. So that those who wish to come over from here to you will not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. You know why I share the gospel? Because after death, there are only two places to go. Heaven. It's permanent. Don't believe the lies of people and Satan that somehow you can migrate, that after you die, there's a chance. Purgatory, more prayer, and you're going to make it, or believe in reincarnation, no such thing. The Bible tells us it is appointed unto men to die once. And after that is judgment. Your eternal destiny is sealed forever. And that is why I share Christ. Because God loves us. He tells us, you warn people. You tell them. I like what C.S. Lewis said. Hell is the greatest monument in the history of the world to human freedom. Do you know what he's talking about? Hell is the greatest monument in the history of the world to human freedom. Because hell is a place where people say, I don't want God's will. I want my will. I want to do things my way. And hell is the place where people can have complete freedom in their mind to do what they want to do. You know why? Look at another quotation. So you'll understand the meaning of subjecting yourself to true freedom, which is God's will versus fake freedom. Everybody read only two kinds of people in the end, according to C.S. Lewis. Those who say to God, thy will be done. That's believers. Every day you say, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. You know what he's saying? If you choose to live a life without God, I don't need God, I don't want you, leave me alone. That, my friend, is the worst thing about hell. Because hell is a place where there is no presence of God. 
It is a place where you choose your way. My friends, hell is a real place. And God is saying, I don't want you to go there. And that's why we share the gospel, the good news about Jesus. When you know Jesus, you submit your will to his will, and you experience real freedom. Our guest sharer, Christian, he said when he was outside, he was in prison to his own will. You know, your will can be a cruel master. However, once you surrender to the Lord, complete freedom. Amen? Now, let me ask you, as you examine yourself, are you a follower of Jesus or not? Do you know Jesus or not? Are there evidence or evidences? The worst thing that can happen to, to me and to you, especially to me, is to teach you the wrong gospel. It's not to tell you the truth. What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Salvation is by faith and faith alone. But the faith that saves will transform your life. That's why the Bible says, this is serious. And he said, then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers in order that he may warn them so that they will not come to this place of torment. Notice the rich man. Suddenly, he began to care for people. Can I tell you why? Because truth changes your life. It changes your mindset. He finally realized hell is real. He finally realized they got to be ready. But who will warn them? This verse tells me those who are dead cannot communicate to the living. There's nothing he can do. The rich man did not even ask to get out of hell. He knew he could not. You know, as Ravi Zacharias once said, truth is that foundational reality we often resist, but that ultimately we cannot escape. Nothing is so destructive as running away from the truth. Friends, some of you are running away from the truth. You heard the Bible many times. You have been warned, but somehow you don't want to change. You have been compromising your life again and again. Let me share with you, Truth is powerful. You cannot outrun truth. It will catch up. And the Bible tells us, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, he begged. He begged. This rich man begged. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He's asking for a supernatural sign, supernatural miracle. However, this is the reply. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even someone rises from the dead. The Bible says miracles does not really transform people. Listen to me. If you're expecting miracles to change you, miracles are temporary. Only the grace of God will transform you from the inside out. Not miracles. The grace of God. How did Jesus explain this? He explained the meaning of Moses and the prophets. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, meaning if they don't listen to the Bible, that's what Jesus is saying. He said to them in Luke 24, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets. And the psalm must be fulfilled. The law and the prophets is the Old Testament that points to Jesus. You see, the entire Bible points to Jesus. Old Testament, New Testament. It's one integrated book. It's all about Jesus. And he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. Without the grace of God, you will not understand the Scripture. That's why I pray for people. But once God gives you a humble heart, and you begin to understand Jesus is the Messiah, He died and rose again from the dead, the Bible tells us you will forever be different. You know why? Thus it is written. What is the gospel? Everybody read. 
Christ would suffer for our sins and rise again from the dead the third day. That, my friend, is the essence of the gospel. Old Testament, New Testament. Repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name. To all nations, beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses. It is a privilege to talk about Jesus. Can I tell you why? Because he promised, if you repent, what does he promise? Forgiveness of sins. My friend, I don't know what you have done in the past. You may feel like God does not love you anymore. Can I tell you something? There's nothing you have done in the past that will prevent God from loving you and from forgiving you. All you need to do is to humble yourself and say, Lord, I repent. I want to change. I want you to hear a song. But before you hear that song, I want to pray a prayer for some of you here who are not yet sure that when you die, you're not going to go to heaven. You're not sure, but you want Jesus. You want forgiveness of sin. Let's bow our heads. And if you want me to pray for you, raise your hands. You are not sure of your eternal destiny. You want to be sure today. You want forgiveness of sin. Raise your hands higher. God has spoken to you, and you want to keep them up high. You know why? I'm the only one watching you. Higher, I want to pray for you. I want today to be the special day of your life. And those of you who are raising your hands high up, you pray this prayer with me. Balcony, second, third, balcony. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner. I need you. I want to repent, Lord. By faith, I am repenting from my old ways. I need your power to change me. And I turn to you, Jesus. I turn to you right now. I receive the forgiveness of sins. Will you, Jesus, forgive me? Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you that you love me. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. <coughs> Listen to this music because this music is powerful. To those of you who know Jesus, I want you to listen to this special number. streets of gold beside the crystal sea you heard the angels singing then someone called your name you turned and saw this young man and he was smiling as he came he said friend you may not know me now and then he said but wait to teach my Sunday school when I was only eight. And every week you would say a prayer before the class would start. One day when you said that prayer, I asked Jesus in my heart. Thank you for giving to the Lord. Oh 
close to cry. I am almost sure there were tears in your eyes. Jesus took your hand and you stood before the Lord. He said, my child, look around you, for great is your reward. close there will be a last song before we sing the last song if God has spoken to you that you want to be used by him you want to make a commitment to share Christ with others I want you to stand up as we sing this last song and I want to pray for you if God is speaking to you and you want to be used by God to share the gospel with others, stand up. I'm going to pray for you. And I want you to know something. God will honor your commitment. Because it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about him. You are doing this because you love him. And because you know he loves you. Father God in heaven, I want to pray for this group of men and women who are standing up today to make a commitment, a commitment to share Christ with others. I pray that you will give them the opportunities, even this week, next week, in the days to come. If they need training, Lord, I pray that they'll be willing to come and be trained and remind them it's all about you, not us. Bless this group of men and women as they make that commitment. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen and amen. God bless you guys. Let's sing this last song. Let's sing our response to God's message for us this afternoon.
in our welcome center just outside of this room. God bless you guys. Jumpstart your spiritual journey by joining an online or offline small group. Go to ccf.org.ph slash dgroup. Worship together with us via live stream here at 9 a.m., 12 noon, or 3 p.m. Philippine Standard Time. Join us at stream.ccf.org.ph. Want to find a CCF near you? Check us out at ccf.org.ph locations. We are so excited you were able to join us today. God bless and see you next time.